that we launched on February 1st, 20, no, we didn't launch on February 1st, 2020. We were supposed to launch on February 1st, 2022. Uh, we're, like I said, I, I hope it's next month. I don't want to give a date because it, it just depends on how things unfold with, with technology. But this is the homepage for this site that we call Lost Voices. I mean, uh, La Florida, the Interactive Digital Archive of the Americas. And you could look at that and the parish records and say, well, it's just a bunch of names. Is this like, um, I mean, it's like Ancestry.com or another repository of just a whole bunch of names. And, and again, like I said, I love having Bob and Rhea in my presentations <laughs> all the time. Uh, Chad, are you there? No. Oh. Okay, good. Uh, like I said, in many of these parish records, a baptism record or a marriage record or a death record or a confirmation record is the first and only time that we see some individuals in the written record. They're not elites. They don't write petitions. We don't see letters, private letters. And the great tragedy for St. Augustine is that we do not have notary records. Those notary records disappeared. And so what could have given us a really an unparalleled window into daily life in St. Augustine, we don't have that source, a source that has been so, uh, so um, uh, advantageous to scholars who work on other parts of Latin America and other parts of European history and elsewhere. We start to see as something that everybody knows about St. Augustine. It was a diverse community from the beginning. And so this is just uh, uh, basically some highlights. There are more than this for the colonial era. People from, from Portugal, France, England, Ireland, Scotland. The Welsh are the best because you should see how Spanish scribes try to write <laughs> Welsh last names. Uh, they're incomprehensible. And many of the names, we still don't know where these people are from because uh, here's so-and-so from this town. E-X-T-P-L-E-P-R-X-X-D. Uh, and everyone looks and says, where is this? Uh, and we still don't know some of these locations. From elsewhere in the Americas. New York, Philadelphia, Virginia, the Carolinas, and Georgia. Many of these individuals are... Uh, either former slaves, runaway slaves, or freed uh, people of African descent who come from as far north as New York who appear in these uh, early parish records. Records about Native Americans, we certainly see references to Tamuqua and Apalachee and Wale and Ais, Yamasi and Potano and Yuchi. And they're certainly walking around St. Augustine in the 17th century, a couple of people that we would call Nawas now or Mayas. Aztecs, uh, who come from central Mexico, who are living in St. Augustine and being recorded there uh, and appear in these uh, parish records. Many of the records also include not just names of people. This is not just about names. The, 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 the kind of information that we can pull from these records is, is quite incredible, including ethnonyms. And so when you look at some of these unique ethnonyms that, we have, uh, that, that appear in these parish records, you see that the, the majority are identified as Congo. Uh, again, these can vary pretty dramatically what they mean. Carabali, Angola, and Mandinga. But you look and see there are 37 unique ethnonyms identified in the parish records. So what did we do? What is this site going to do when it eventually launch, launches on... February 1st, 2022. Mm. The first step, and we did this in conjunction with a number of other things in order to finish this in a timely manner, but we wanted to transcribe and translate the entire archive. So 8,258 pages, most of them written in Spanish, about 600 pages in Latin, and, uh, and some pages in the 19th century in English. We transcribed all 8,258 pages. That work was finished. That work's been finished now for about seven months. We then translated all 8,258 pages. So the Latin documents were translated into Spanish and into English. The Spanish into English. And so anybody who goes to the site, and I'll show you uh, shortly what this looks like, you'll be able to see the original text 
you'll then be able to see the original transcription and you'll be able to see the translation work of that uh, uh, of the uh, original transcription. Then we had a team of seven of us who spent almost two years, pretty close to two years, registering all the data points that appear in these documents. And this is just a screenshot. If, if this could extend all the way to capture all the data points we were trying to capture, we'd be in Jacksonville. <laughs> uh, well, not quite, but there are dozens and dozens and dozens of data points. How did each entry, how did each scribe record a person, the, an ethnicity, a race, an ethnonym, uh, marital status, all kinds of other information, place of origin, place of residence, residency status, etc. And we wanted to record all of that. Uh, and so that took us the better part of two years to finish all of the data registration so that this information could then be put into a database that was built specifically for this project. Uh, that we collaborated with uh, a team from Spain uh, to do that. And so when you go into the Lost Voices, this is what the Lost Voices page looks like right now. So when you get onto the site, you'll see uh, there'll be an introduction and then there'll be, there's a button here to enter the virtual archive where you can go in and say, I want to look at these records. I want to consult uh, what you have in there. This page isn't going to look like this. So before you start throwing that, I don't like that page. Uh, uh, it's going to look, in fact, quite a bit different. But you can filter by dates, uh, and you can use the search bar, and you can use some other filters to find the documents. So for example, you can choose a documented race. You can choose this again. This is changing uh, sex, occupation, place of origin, uh, place of residence. You can choose a specific data set, or you can choose a category baptisms, burials, confirmations, marriages, uh, miscellaneous, and then for those who want to only work with the Golden Book of the Menorcans, because I know there is that audience, I thought we have to create a separate one just for the Golden Book of the Menorcans. So if you were to use this as a filter, the Golden Book of the Menorcans technically is, is box 14 and 15 of the archive. And so if you, if you filter that, that whole book appears. 14 and 15 combined, and you can flip through it uh, page from the first page to the end of the index. And so you can choose that filter, or you can choose a name. So Maria de la Concepcion, and if you plugged in that name, you get this entry, well, you get a number, uh, but this entry here, and you can click on the image for this particular entry, and you get into the archive. And here you have the tabs that see the original transcription, the English translation, and Spanish. You can see, I'll show you a little bit more closely, that this is a record written originally in Latin. And it records the baptism of Maria de la Concepcion. And here you have the Latin term for negra. She is four years of age, and she is the slave of Carlos Jimenez. And so, it's this entry here. Uh, you can hide this panel with the transcriptions, translations, if you only want to look at the document, and you can look at the document up close in high res. So you can see the entry, and here's Thomas Hassett's signature, for those of you who are, who are familiar with Hassett. Uh, and, uh, and again, you can s move to the next document, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one after that. Here's the whole page if you wanted to, uh, to just see that. The other thing that we did is we, we drew polygons. We wanted to do a sample for each box and each book in the archive. So we drew polygons around the words, which allows then, when you're on the site, for those pages, if you scroll over the word, the transcription appears. So we did that for about 1,250 pages, and then we realized we will never finish this project, <laughs> ever. Uh, the idea is that eventually maybe there's some OCR program that somebody can create that can use this as a kind of tool, or I can, you know, unsuspecting graduate students, hey, <laughs> Uh, do, would you like to come in for a meeting? Then you close the door and you say, okay, draw some polygons. I'll see you in six months. 
in any case, it's a, it's a wonderful way, I think, for students and others to engage with these, uh, with these kinds of records. The other thing, of course, the other element that I think is, is, for us at least, one of the major contributions of the site is we wanted to build a biographical database. We wanted to give a sense that, we wanted to give a very clear picture of Florida that this was not a place with eight people until air conditioning. <laughs> you know, that it wasn't just a place of people we call conquistadors. Uh, that this was a mixed community and the way to do that was to create this biographical <coughs> dictionary. A searchable biographical dictionary. So if you go, you see the tabs here, if you went to the people section, this is where those uh, individual biographical profiles are housed. And as of this morning, if you get on the site, we have 36,344. That is only with the people on the site from 1768 to 18, early 1880s. Most of these are 1768 to 1821. We have not uploaded the people from 1594 to 1764. I think when we do that, this number will be closer to 75,000 or 80,000. So all of that work is done. We just need to migrate that in there. So again, you can use the filters by date, data set, names, occupation, etc., to search for people. And one of the things you might notice from this image is that here's Vicente Llerena, but here's Vicente Llerena, and here's Vicente Llerena. So you have three people with the same name. You look a little bit more closely here. And you see that his spouse was Maria de la O. Sanchez de Ortigosa. Same spouse, same spouse. So this person is almost certainly one person. The challenge of the data registration is when you find uh, one person, we enter that with a unique ID, but that person might appear in a different book, a different box, uh, later in, uh, in a different document. And so when, you regist when we registered all of these individuals, it was impossible at this stage to connect all of them. So over the next year, we're going to have to start to work through this database to combine profiles to say this, three, this guy is probably just one, and we can combine that. What you notice as well is that his place of origin is identified differently in each entry. They're all Canary Islands, they're all Tenerife, but it's recorded differently. Anybody who has done historical research, it doesn't take you very long to realize there is no uniformity. Scribes don't write people's names the same way, they don't record them the same way, the kind of information is different. How do you capture those variants? How do you capture the nuance of the archival records? And this is really something we wanted to do. So when you expand a profile into a full pro profile, you might get something like this. This is the most recent mock-up that our colleague Rachel Sanderson put together uh, at about midnight last night. It was finished. Uh, and, and the idea is to show these documented attributes that can vary depending on the entry. So what we often find, for example, when you look at race, anybody who has worked on this issue in colonial Latin America, uh, certainly uh, I'm sure Jane Landers has talked about this extensively when she's spoken, if you've read her Atlantic Creole's book, you see this come out very clearly, uh, that races are not fixed like that. You don't just, uh, people's races change over time and depending on context, etc. So they don't appear the same way. And we didn't want to simply impose racial categories if they're not there. And we wanted to maintain the distinctions between these racial categories depending on the entry. So occupations, places over time, the idea in this documented attributes is you can show these values, these multiple values, and the dates and the documents that are associated with those individuals. You can also see the possible duplicates or you can hide those. 
So these people might be the same, but we're not entirely sure. Uh, and then you see where they appear in the sacramental records. And here again, you can click on the document and get to the original document that way as well. Other records that start to appear in this, and this brings us more closely to the connection, what do these records say about people of African descent? What's in there? Uh, in terms of the parish records uh, related to uh, people of African descent. Here's one example, and I'll show you a, a couple more, but I wanted to highlight this one. I, I couldn't reach Jane uh, in time, and maybe somebody knows the answer to this question. Does anybody know th the name of Captain Francisco Menendez's wife? Anna. Is it just Anna? Anna Maria. Is it Anna Maria? What do we know about her? Mm -hmm. um, God, I don't know if it's her, her maiden name or godparents' name was Escobar. Uh huh. And that's, that's everything James Bullock told me. Okay. <laughs> He's my go to guy. Okay. So in box eight of marriages, these are these loose, loose leaf papers of marriages in the parish records uh, that, are, that, that cover the years 1720 to 1763. And this entry in box eight records the marriage of Francisco Menendez and Ana Maria. Morenos esclavos. He's listed as the slave of Francisco Menendez. Uh, and this is the marriage record from May 25th, 1733. I think that's him. I think that's him, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but, yeah. How long does the barrel have to be before you shoot the fish? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is just one of thousands of different entries uh, that cover uh, that, that include people of African descent. And you can s visualize this. You can start to see this visually in the records. One of the features on the site is this data visualization tool. And if you enter into this data visualization tool, you can create your own graphs, charts, etc., using the information recorded in the archive. So here, for example, uh, I've filtered the date 1768 to, uh, to 1821 and assigned these racial categories, mestiza, mestizo, uh, morena, moreno, mulata, mulato, negra, negro, parda, pardo. <laughs> We've left all the races in the original Spanish. We didn't translate them. Uh, and you start to see what's striking, uh, and again, these numbers you have to take with, a, with, with some measure of caution because it, almost certainly there are some people counted more than once. But not too many. Uh, but what you see consistently, more women than men, more women than men, more women than men, in every single one of those categories. There are more enslaved African women in St. Augustine than there are men, consistently. And then you start to compare, sorry, this one is... Yeah, uh, racial designation by free person or enslaved person, or imputed free person or imputed slave person. And you start to see again consistently more women than men in all of those categories. You can compare then tables across and do say I want to choose uh, these documented races on one side and then I want to compare uh, for example, uh, enslaved, free, imputed, uh, impu imputed free, and imputed slave. And you can see already, just 1764 to 1821, enslaved, almost 3,000. This doesn't include the British. These are people who appear in the parish records. Almost 3,000. And the records then that are recorded in the, uh, on the site have the profiles of those individuals. So we can start to rebuild a database of people who are uh, beyond people who come to, uh, to Fort Mose, but people who are also living in St. Augustine. 
and you can start to, to chart over time uh, how categories change. So periods where Francisco Menendez, like in this marriage record, if that in fact is him, and, and I think it is, I think that 1733 record is his marriage record, he's still enslaved at that point. And so what users will be able to do is see, okay, for this period you have somebody who's enslaved, but then free. And we have people, not very many, but near the, in, the, in the end of the colonial uh, era, where you have people who fall into all three categories. They're enslaved, they're free, and they're slaveholders. Now, not very many. What you also see as well, and what's becoming abundantly clear, is that if you are enslaved, it was very, very, very difficult to get your freedom. Very difficult. So most of these individuals who are enslaved remain enslaved. Uh, like Gratia uh, and, and many others, uh, that's how they spend uh, their uh, lives in St. Augustine. I appreciate the opportunity to share this and, and thank you for coming out tonight, so thank you. Thank you.